Hey, what's going on? It's Dave Rettelberger here with the Schottenstein Center and Nationwide Arena. Time to check in with the one and only, the legendary, the iconic, <laughs> Gary the I Arena Guy. Wow. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> so we, we actually had a, we should, and, and this is maybe a topic for a future show, uh, what is iconic, right? Because uh, uh, we've talked about like what, what defines an icon because I remember one time one of your interns was using, uh, was doing some kind of social media post and wanted to call a performer iconic and you're like, yeah, that's not an icon. Yeah, that person's had two hits. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, iconic is, uh, uh, I think probably, <laughs> and so we're talking about iconic with me, so this is awkward. But iconic is probably above the legend status or equal to being a legend. And somebody has got a great history, a great reputation, somebody who's <laughs> definitely you, definitely the arena guy. <laughs> I'm just laughing. But iconic is and legendary are overused. They do apply to a lot and, and a lot of the people that we present but not everybody. So I think it's an earned status as well. Yes, for sure. Well, we're gonna to talk That's today. True. Today's topic is actually the best opening act you've ever seen. You've ever been at a concert and an opening act has blown you away uh, yeah. or gone on to become very successful. So we're gonna talk about that here in a few minutes, but before we do, Arena Guy, I'm just glad that last Blue Jackets game wrapped up uh, before uh, we had a chance to uh, record this. Uh, obviously, uh, here we're recording this as Thursday morning. Boy, I, I tell you, I spent, I don't know, what was it, six hours basically watching Blue Jackets hockey on Tuesday. That was, yeah. that was insane. It was insane. It's so exciting to, to have pro sports back. It's so exciting to have hockey back. It's so exciting to have the Blue Jackets back and to have the Blue Jackets doing so incredibly well. It couldn't be more exciting. It reminded me of a Springsteen concert. When I remember <laughs> the last time we saw Springsteen and he just keeps playing, right? And I'm on, and I'm just watching the show and I'm exhausted. And I'm like, yes. oh my, this is going on for, <laughs> this is really long, it's awesome. Yeah. And then I remember like, you're just standing here watching it. How about these guys playing the game or playing that show? That's, it, 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 it was unbelievable to watch. And, you know, I, I kept uh, wanting to go and do something else with my life. Um, at the same time, I couldn't take my eyes off the game, right? It was just, I, I just kept yelling out to the rest of the family who deserted me hours before. I'm like, quintuple over time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so exciting. And uh, yeah, Springsteen, you know, he plays for three hours roughly, yeah. and maybe a little bit, give or take. And I've often wondered about the guitarists or the bass players, what their fingers are like after a show. I mean, wow. But uh yeah, no, the Blue Jackets, very exciting time. And uh, yeah, go Jackets. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, hey, speaking of exciting times, one year ago today, uh, from the day that we are recording this, uh, you and I were enjoying Queen and Adam Lambert here at, uh, at Nationwide Arena. Uh, boy, that was an amazing, amazing night. One year ago. Yeah, no, time flies. I can't imagine that. It, it, in some ways, it seems longer. In some ways, it feels like a whole different planet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it, it was. It's a whole different world than it is now, that's for sure. But, yeah, Queen was a show that you and I both, uh, as music fans, were looking forward to a lot. And there were question marks about Adam Lambert. We know what a great singer he is, but come on. He's taking the place of Freddie Mercury. How was that going to go? And it ended up being awesome. I'm actually getting a little chills thinking about it because it was <laughs> Awesome night. It really was. And where Adam Lambert succeeded was that he did not try to replace or imitate Freddie Mercury. He was Adam Lambert on stage singing Queen rather than Adam Lambert trying to be Queen. And so he had his own elements. I mean, he was true to the art, if you want to call it that. But it was Adam Lambert singing. He was not imitating. So it it gave the show a whole lot of credibility in my mind because, you know, when Freddie Mercury passed away, we lost one of the greatest vocalists of all time, one of the greatest rock front men ever. And so he can't be replaced. So why even try? But they found a great guy in Adam Lambert to, to present their legacy to current fans. And I think their fan base has actually grown in recent yeah. times and Adam Lambert is a, has a lot to do with that and and the rest of the band 
you know, he was so respectful of the legacy and the history of the band and the rest of the band were so good. It just, we were seeing history and uh, what an incredible night. I mean, I could keep talking about it. It was so great. It was, it was one of those nights where if you, if you were there, you will, it will stay with you forever. It was just a, yeah. one of those perfect concerts. Uh, really amazing. And everything you said about Adam Lambert is absolutely true. Plus the, 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 you know, guys in Queen, Brian and Roger really delivered, uh, you know, not as a nostalgia act, but as a, as a, just a great arena rock act, uh, which was just awesome to see. And then even when they, they did bring out like the hologram of Freddie for a little bit, uh, or the projected image. And it was just, it was so cool. Just a whole night. One of those yeah. really, really, uh, shows that I'm really glad that I got to not just see a little bit of, but I, I stuck around through the entire show. I know you did uh, with your son, right? Yeah, I brought my, I had to bring my son to that one. It's like, this is, this is one of those shows that, uh, you know, he's going to remember for a long time. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I really uh, uh, admire that you do with your son is that you expose him to some of the great music acts that were not in their heyday when he was even alive, probably. Yeah, for sure. So you appreciate some of the great music around. So, yeah, and what was fun, uh, kind of along those lines is, the arena guy, uh, before our major concerts, go out and talk to a lot of fans. And it was amazing how many young fans were out there uh, outside Nationwide Arena before that concert. And, and one kid actually sang part of Bohemian Rhapsody for me. And I told him, how did you know about Bohemian Rhapsody? And he said he got exposed to Queen from his grandmother. But <laughs> he had watched the movie over and over and over again. He saw it almost 20 times, I think he said. Wow. I said, boy, as soon as it's done, you pop that DVD back in, don't you? I said, DVD? I download it. I said, oh, my God. Now even that is old. So, yeah. Used to be the VHS cassette, right? That's oh, my gosh. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Hey, uh, speaking of, of great memories of great concerts, uh, today also, Mark, it was, it was today back in 1967 that, oh. Fleetwood, that Fleetwood Mac played their first ever live show. Uh, August 13th of 67. And it was, a, you know, it was a very different lineup than, you know, uh, what Fleetwood Mac we came to be. But as I was looking for something fun to put on, on social, I tripped across, uh, and I shared it with you and the rest of the staff, uh, this little documentary of Fleetwood Mac uh, getting ready for the, it's the Say You Will Tour from 2003. And um, to see Fleetwood Mac as they're kind of getting ready to launch that tour from the Schottenstein Center. How cool uh, to see that little bit of footage of what now, looking at 2020, is very young Stevie Nicks <laughs> yeah. from 2003. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was just great to see see those guys excited to take the stage and shot to kick off that tour. It's it's very cool that happens. Uh, fortunately, Columbus is a music hotspot for for uh, major entertainment, and so. Occasionally when we make a documentary, when we're included in a, an artist documentary or some social media posts, I mean, it's very exciting, it's very cool. And uh, that was a great uh, clip from that documentary. You mentioned uh, Fleetwood Mac started in the 60s. They were a totally different band, not only with the lineup, but with their sound. They were a blues band at the time. And they didn't have any top 40 hits or any of the hits that they do in concert now. Yeah, that's the current Fleetwood Mac. So they were very blues oriented early on and uh, they've kind of morphed and evolved into what they are today. And uh, I mean, they're one of the greatest shows ever. That, that, that clip that you shared was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, uh, and to see, you know, Stevie uh, helping adjust Lindsey Buckingham's outfit right before, you know, back backstage in our dressing rooms and to see Mick Fleetwood walk in the star hall that, that we haven't seen in a really long time. Uh, it just brought yeah. back some great memories for a lot of our staff of a, of a really special night. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're like, oh, Fleetwood Mac's coming around again. Yeah, actually, I've played a lot. I would give my left arm to see a Fleetwood Mac show tonight. <laughs> oh, I know. Not only are they one of the best live bands ever, the last one that they did was so good. Um, but just see a live concert again, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> no yeah. kidding. One of the things that let's, let's go ahead and that brings up our, our, our big topic of the day. And uh, uh, when you go to a concert, opening acts. Sometimes yes. you get there and it's just uh, music to find your seat by. Uh, sometimes uh, it's somebody new, 
to actually make you leave your seat and go out and visit the concession stand. But sometimes it's also a great avenue to discover a new artist. Arena Guy, what's, what's your feeling on, on opening acts? Well, uh, I, th I think it depends. Uh, first off, there are a whole bunch of different kind of opening acts. There, there's the, uh, the opening acts where there's a, a, the big headliner and uh, they want to expose a new artist uh, that usually is on their same record label or is on their same management, uh, managed by the same people. And so it's an opportunity to expose a new artist. And we see that all the time and it's great. It's great when we, I love to discover new artists and new music and uh, that sort of thing. And so sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's obvious they're there for that exposure and the arena is maybe a fifth full and people are coming in late and all that stuff. And sometimes, you know, you, you hear somebody great. So sometimes it, it's, it's the uh, up and comers. Other times, um, you know, you got a headliner that maybe their show isn't that long, so they need two or three opening acts to kind of expand it a little bit. Uh, there's, uh, there's the event opening acts, you know, like the Rolling Stones or U2, where they get uh, solid artists already to help make it an event. Yeah. Like the Rolling Stones of Kid Rock or U2 with John Mayer or, or whoever it is. Um, and then there's the dual headliners like uh, Chicago and, and uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, Journey, and Def Leppard. And those. So there's a whole kind of different uh, those aren't really opening acts. Those are co-headliners, but there's a whole bunch of different kinds. So, um, yeah, I, I get excited when we announce a concert. One of my first questions is who's opening, right? Because sometimes that can make a really excellent show. Fantastic. You know, well, like one I can think of is off the top of my head, the who with, uh, pretenders. Yes. Uh, it's kind of an interesting combination, but man, you're getting two, I guess we can say iconic bands. <laughs> show. The Pretender's clearly the opening act, but they're established and they've got a big history. So they're not an up and comer by any means. And they're not necessarily pushing anything except their legacy. And, uh, and that's before the big act. And a lot of times the opening acts are to warm up the crowd and get them excited because the headliner wants that. But then you get the major acts like Elton John or, or somebody that doesn't need an opening act because their mere presence gets that audience excitement going. So there's a whole bunch of dynamics involved with the opening act. Are, so. are you a guy, you know, if you buy a ticket for a show, are you a guy who always shows up in time to see the opening act? Me, yes, I am because yeah. I want to experience that. Same, uh, you know, I, I bought the ticket, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see every minute of live music I can. You know, uh, uh, our booking uh, department, Breeden, uh, you know, he was when years ago when we were uh, booking a show. He had a he talked about a theory of sometimes when you add the opening act, it can really elevate the show. And he called that mm -hmm. his his kind of shorthand for that was one plus one equals three. Mm -hmm. So when you've got a when you've got a solid headliner, but then you add a really good opening act, and 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 not even necessarily you know like a co-headliner, but just somebody who's really good, kind of like that Pretenders Who situation, or when like John Legend opened for Sade, it elevates it from you know either one of those acts but together it becomes a, a, a you know a special night and that that one act plus one act equals something even bigger than the two of them you know when the two of them individually it's totally true and what's also exciting is when you have an act that maybe has had a hit or two when it's booked by the time the show comes they're a little more uh established that's exciting and it's also exciting, and you and I have talked about this before too, when we have an opening act that nobody's really heard of before or maybe don't really know that well, but years later, they return as a headliner. Yes. And that's very cool. Or I got, you know, a, couple of the, I got a couple of those on my list. Uh, yeah. But before, before we get there, let's address the young lady on your shirt. Oh, okay. Uh, Taylor Swift. I have, now, who is this? <laughs> is it Taylor who? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's been a while since, but her new album broke all kinds of records and she surprised everybody by releasing it. Uh, this is Taylor Swift and uh, she is probably one of the most famous opening acts in nationwide arena history, maybe. Yeah. Uh, because she started out uh, opening for artists like uh, Tim McGraw. Of course, she had a hit called Tim McGraw, which didn't hurt her getting on the bill. Uh, uh, George Strait, and Rascal Flatts. The story with Rascal Flatts, I don't know if you know this story or not, but Rascal Flatts, with Columbus Ties, of course, Rascal Flatts was on tour with an up-and-comer named Eric Church. Yeah, okay. And 
Page got fired from that tour because he played too long and, and he took up too much time and uh, Rascal Flatts fired him. So they replaced Eric Church with Taylor Swift, who was very young. Her first album was out. She was like, what, 15 or something? Yeah. And she was on the fast track up. And so Rascal Flatts kind of gave her her first major exposure on the touring scene uh, with that. And Eric, Eric Church joked with her later and said, you know, when your first record goes gold, I expect a gold record because if it wasn't for me playing too long, you <laughs> fly. And so he, he patted himself on the back for advancing her career. And sure enough, when her first album went gold, she sent him one. You could, that, that's how Taylor is. You just yeah. know that about her. It's, it's yeah. great. She actually opened shows yeah, at both the shot and Nationwide Arena. And, you know, it's, it's you and I talk, joke about this, but it's like it's one of the reasons why you watch an opening act because you never know where they're going to be in a few years. It's, and, and it's funny that you mentioned Taylor Swift because I think it was on one of her tour stops at, at Nationwide where it's big sold out night and this um, little uh, uh, uncharismatic looking redhead guy come out and took the stage with his guitar. Oh uh, yes, well he's on my list. And Ed Sheeran, right? He opened for Taylor Swift at Nationwide Arena. And with just his guitar, nothing else on stage, he captivated that crowd uh, and just blew him away. By the way, Florida Georgia Line was also opened before Ed Sheeran took the stage on that same show. We didn't even know that Florida Georgia Line was there that night until, they, <laughs> until shortly before they took the stage. And we're like, oh no, there's two opening acts tonight. I said, all right, hey, the show's sold out. Keep, keep throwing acts on stage. What, what a great night that was. But you need to see that Taylor kind of repay that favor years later for Ed Sheeran, who would go on, of course, to sell out a couple nights at Nationwide Arena, just like Taylor's done. Again, Ed Sheeran, just himself, selling out two arena nights, and then he would, would go on and do a, a stadium tour. And said, how the heck can a guy with a guitar uh, by himself captivate an arena and a stadium? And he knows how to do it. He does Absolutely. it. He, opened remember, up the, yeah, the, he was just starting to happen when Taylor yeah. Swift. Uh, had him as an opening act and he they had to really sell him and he you know is he he's a new up-and-comer and exciting and he's kind of an awkward looking guy he doesn't look like your typical rock star but he was so good and th that tour really elevated him yeah we know awkward looking guys right where that's <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah he opened up he did a he did a cover of uh, Black Street's No Diggity on acoustic guitar <laughs> and it was just one of the coolest moments because uh, I was actually in the pit, you know, with a photographer. So I'm looking straight up at this guy going, all right, let's, let's see what you can do with this crowd. And I remember, oh, this guy's got it. That, that's, yeah. that was one of those great opening act moments. So with that, let's, uh, what's, what's, on, what's on your list, Arena Guy? Well, uh, I guess I'll just start with Ed Sheeran. He opened for Taylor Swift. We all remember that. And he was one of those that when you saw him, you felt like he was going to have success. Yeah. So when he came back and, and played those two nights uh, as a headliner, he had a guy on that I really liked a lot, and I thought he killed it. Uh, and uh, he, he had had some hit records, has, hadn't had them in a while, but they were a good combination. He had James Blunt as the opening act, and he was one of my favorites. Um, when uh, Elton John, of course, I have to mention Elton John, but he typically doesn't have an opening act. Uh, he, he's one of those artists that doesn't need any warm up really, and he plays a long show, so he doesn't need anyone to make it, uh, you know, the, the timing uh, seem worthwhile. Uh, sure. But this, this is an example of a labor, label mate uh, being put on the bill, and uh, he was on Geffen Records at the time when Quarter Flash, remember them? Quarter Flash was his opening yeah, act. Hard my that, heart. That was just a, yeah, uh, that was gift i think that he gave his record label to allow them to play but those i mean i've got more but uh cindy lopper opening for share i mean how cool oh, was yeah that? that was great right i forgot about yeah. that one. that was uh that was really cool and uh and cindy i'd never seen her live and she just lit that crowd up it was almost kind yeah. of one of those where you you kind of you know steal steal the show uh, in a way, so it was just that was that was great. That was a real that was a really good one. Uh, you know, you mentioned when you're talking about sometimes an opening act catches fire. 
right? Yeah. And um, have you, this is one that sticks out for me is, is many, many years ago uh, in the early 90s. Uh, <laughs> the, well, I've got uh, one from then too. Uh, MC Hammer. MC Hammer was on tour. And he had a little band named Boys to Men opening up. And the tour had gone on sale like a year ago. The show was, uh, uh, you know, happening. And it was one of those situations where as the tour went along, MC Hammer had kind of like the album didn't, too legit to quit, wasn't exactly right. as legit as he'd hoped for. Uh, right. <laughs> and Boys to Men were just exploding to the point where people were more excited about the opening act than the headliner. And so that was, again, it was, it was an awesome show. Uh, it was a lot of fun. But have you ever been in one of those where the opening act is kind of blown up? Well, uh, Boys to Men is on my list. Um, and I, I was able to meet Boys to Men when they were, they may have had like one hit. And it was one of those where you just sensed they were going to be big. And sure enough, they were. So that was an example. Um, also, we did MC Hammer back in, in my other life in Illinois, where Vanilla Ice was the opening act. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, one that sticks out, and we're not, you know, we're not talking like Rolling Stones level or anything, but we did uh, Alabama in their height in the, in the 80s. And, uh, and I hate to say reference dates because then it kind of ages me, but uh, they were on RCA records, and this is another label mate they put on. There was a new country singer named Clint Black that was on the bill, and nobody really knew who he was. And he was one of those that I watched and said, you know what, he's going to turn into something. And he had a uh, country music career and, and still performing, but he had a hit record run that was unbelievable. And so that's another example that it was kind of fun to see somebody that surprised me at the time. Yeah, country music does such a great job. Uh, better than better than any other genre of supporting those acts, and then those acts come back as headliners uh, within years to come. You and I saw that recently with Chris Young and, and Kane Brown. Well, yeah, that's the perfect example because they opened for uh, Jason Aldean. Jason Aldean, yeah. Jason Aldean. It was Jason Aldean, uh, uh, Chris Young, Kane Brown, and that was. What a great show. And then like the next year, it's Chris Young and, Zane and Kane Brown. And it was incredible. It was great. So both Kane Brown and Chris Young elevated themselves. And now Kane Brown is a headliner. So it's, it was, it's really cool. I think that was one of those when it was booked, they weren't as big as they became when, when they hit the arenas. Yeah. It just, it was right about it was, country music that country music has the best opening acts because typically they don't have one unless it's a major superstar. But usually they have two or three opening acts. So you get an up-and-comer, you get somebody that's kind of established, you get somebody with the name, and then you get the headliner. And it's a whole evening of, it's almost like a variety show in a way. Yeah, it, it, they do a great job with that. And, and sometimes it's just that, that little, like, you know, three-song mini set, uh, yeah. you know, a band like Midland opening up. And all of a sudden you're going to go, oh, I'm going to check this band out. And they yeah. go from opening act to playing Buckeye Country Superfest. Uh, yeah. down the road and it's just it's neat to need to see those bands that that just kind of blow up and, and like I said country music has done such a, a, a great job with that over the years 100 percent. who else got on your list um well I would say you know and I'm not necessarily mentioning just like superstars but right John Mayer uh a couple times ago a solo uh, he had Philip Phillips on. I thought it was really good. I thought Philip Phillips was, uh, you know, American Idol winner, uh, was a really good opening act. One that I really like and I look forward to every time. And, and we do New Kids on the Block uh, like every couple of years, it seems. And they know their audience. They yeah. are not trying to be current hit makers. They do release new material, but they, they know that their audience are now women in their 30s, maybe 40s, who were huge fans before, and it's nostalgia, it's a girls' night out, that sort of thing. And so New Kids on the Block is very smart in packaging along with them acts from the same eras. Um, you know, it, it's been 98 Degrees before, it's been Boys to Men, uh, it's been uh, one of my funnest, uh, the, the funnest ones was Debbie Gibson with Tiffany, uh, and uh, and, and others. I mean, all day long, we've got Paul Abdul. Yeah. 
There, there, uh, so, there, have, been, there have been so many, and you know, TLC uh, jumps to yeah. mind there. Uh, uh, salt and pepper, I'm not sure. Uh, but here's the but thing, yeah. you know, is they know their audience. And it's a, one of my favorite kind of opening acts, that, and I'm glad you brought that up, is that act that you never got to see in concert. They're not probably doing their own tour anywhere. And, but they get- At that level. Right, and, and they get added to that kind of bill. And all of a sudden now, I can see Tiffany and Debbie Gibson. I, you know, I would never have gone to buy a ticket for, for, for that individually, but as part of that package, as often the New Kids Tour was called, uh, or Block Party or Mixtape or whatever. But <laughs> it's, it's, it just makes for a really fun night. I remember Tina Turner bringing Joe Cocker along. Uh, you know, so it, uh, the police, when they reunited, brought Elvis Costello. And maybe those acts are playing at the Ohio Theater or one of the, uh, you know, promo West Pavilion. But great to see them in, and it really can add some real entertainment value to a concert and uh, it, it's a lot of fun when you when you do get to see those acts that maybe you've always been on your concert bucket list that we always talk about uh, and then they get added to Billy like oh well, that's that's a total bonus yeah totally and uh, you mentioned Tina Turner and and maybe I'll mention a couple of unusual opening acts in the past real quick yeah sure you mentioned Tina Turner uh, open for Lionel Richie now that does not seem like wow a combination that makes sense. Tina Turner's all like rock and roll and run around the stage and all that. And, and Lionel Richie is hello. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and even Tina said, that is not my crowd, but she had not had her big comeback yet when she opened okay. Richie. She had what's love got to do with it. But, but, you know, as far as elevating herself to the level where she became with, with her hits in the eighties, uh, she hadn't done that yet. So they teamed those two together. It was a solid show. I mean, Tina Turner, wow, cool. She was a legend. But, uh, you know, doing Proud Mary next to Stuck on You, this was kind of a little bit unusual. So that was an unusual opening act. And that tour did phenomenally well, probably in large part because Tina Turner was exploding at that time. And Lionel Richie was also hugely popular as well. But some unusual opening acts. Let me just mention a few. Yeah, sure. The Jimi Hendrix Experience opened for the Monkees. <laughs> That's a show. That's his show. Um, uh, Elton John opened for Leon Russell. Nice, okay. Nice. That, I mean, that kind of makes sense at Absolutely. the time. Writer stuff. Steely Dan opened for Elton John in the early 70s. That's kind of interesting. Uh, there was this kid out of Tupelo, uh, Mississippi, named Elvis Presley that opened for these old-time country singers named Hank Snow and Farron Young. People watching don't even know who they are. But imagine having somebody like Elvis that was starting to happen, swiveling his hips and, and doing all that Elvis does, opening for a traditional country music crooner. crooner. He lasted one time with Farron Young and said, I can't do this again. <laughs> um, the Beatles in Germany opened for Brenda Lee, who most people know from singing Rockin' Around the Christmas Tree, but she had a bunch of hits and she's, you know, a country pop singer at the time. Garth Brooks opened for Reba. That makes sense. But Reba has a great track record of good opening acts. Brooks and Dunn and, and Garth Brooks and going on to become huge. And uh, Billy Joel opened for the Jay Giles Band. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So just some of those are very kind of, you know, when, when artists are up and coming, you don't really know where they fit with other artists. So they're, the combinations sometimes don't always make sense. And then as they both become established, you go, really? Jimi Hendrix opening for the monkeys, yeah. you know, the Beatles opening for Brenda Lee, but uh, yeah. So there's some unusual ones. Um, I kind of liked uh, L King has been good. Open L King has been great. She's got her, you know, central Ohio ties. Uh, and she's been, she's been such a thrill to have. She's always so excited to play. Uh, in Columbus. We've had the chance to talk to her a couple times. Uh, yeah. she's, just a, she's a lot of fun and a great live act. Oh yeah, great. And she's always so enthusiastic to uh, to be back in Columbus and to say hi to us and that sort of thing. I also like Casey Musgraves. Yes. Yeah. big now. She's won a lot of awards and really, I'm not sure, she, she fits into the country music category, but she really goes beyond that. And we've had- she opened, her, she opened for Katy Perry, right? Wasn't that one Katie of the times she's played? But, it's one of those unusual ones. It's like the country singer Cam opening for Sam Smith. It's just kind of interesting to combine different genres. Katie Musgraves opening for Katy Perry. Yeah. Very interesting, but it worked. It did work. It, and I it think sometimes artists don't want artists who 
are exactly in the same genre because they don't want them to steal their thunder in a way. Yeah. So that's sure. an example of that. Hey, you mentioned unusual pairings. I know you know about this one, but I have to bring it up, of course. Uh, it's from the, the early 80s uh, when Prince infamously opened for the Rolling Stones. Oh, that's so funny. I wish you could see my notes here. Um, it's, it's right here in the, I wrote it in the margin. So you know about that and you are a Prince fan. Maybe you talk about that because, uh, you know, uh, Mick, Mick, uh, you know, it, it loves, you know, new music and loves to discover artists. Uh, and so he'd seen uh, a Prince and thought this guy should open for us. And unfortunately the, the stadium crowd, I think it was the LA Coliseum, uh, was not excited to see this guy come out in a leather trench coat and bikini <laughs> briefs and not much else. Uh, I remember and, nobody, very few people knew who Prince was at this time. Right, so he comes out and takes the stage and they are there to see the Stones. And it was uh, a, a drunk, rowdy summertime crowd and they booed Prince off the stage. Totally they shook Prince up. At him. Yeah, they threw, they, threw, they threw stuff at him. Uh, totally threw him off and they, they left the stage. The, the interesting thing is that they were booked for two shows. So the next day they came back to do it again. And by then word had kind of gotten around about how they'd been booed off the stage, how Prince and his band. And so uh, happened again, happened again. And Prince who, would, who was live, you know, kind of on the rise had never experienced this. But what it did is it motivated him to kind of become a better act uh, and he's like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to come back and I'm going to rock the faces off these people. And shortly after that, he went to the studio, recorded the 1999 album and less than a year later, the Purple Rain album and became at the time, arguably one of the top big, biggest acts, uh, on the planet. But it was that failed experience as an opening act that kind of motivated him to these people that hate me, I'm going to win them over. I'm going to blow them away. And so it's kind yeah. of a, a cool thing, but but not not great at the time. So I, yeah, you, I, I'm sure you've seen a few rough opening acts in your in your time too. Yeah, I, I, none come to mind immediately. But yeah, you've seen some where you just kind of go, well, this is a favor. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, funny I, thing about Prince though is that one of those nights he only made it through about three and a half songs before he walked off, and Mick Jagger talked him back onto going on stage, and so he did a little bit more and he closed with uh, uh, why did you treat me so bad and he closed with that which was perfect why did you treat me so bad ah oh, there you go yes yeah. well uh, the only act I ever saw get booed off stage I saw Marilyn Manson uh, one year at Ozfest uh, out at Polaris Amphitheater uh, I saw Manson get booed off stage uh, he was <laughs> so angry it was so angry and that, that crowd was ugly and that was that was of course uh, the year the famous uh, Ozfest riot uh, here in Columbus, which is a, a topic for a whole nother show on, on someday. Uh, yeah. But hey, uh, before before we wrap things up, uh, Rolling Stones opening acts, I definitely want to mention Blues Traveler. So okay. the first time the Stones played the shoe, the second time, of course, they had Kid Rock, which you, you, you had mentioned, uh, and we've talked about previously on this podcast, but first time uh, Blues Traveler opened up. And that was one of, those, one of those bands that maybe you know them from their one or two hits on the radio. But you see them in concert, you go, "Wow, that's a that's a great live act." And especially when you're playing a stadium as an opening act, uh, you've got to have your act together, literally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Um, and before I close my list, and you know what, this th we could talk for hours about opening acts because you know there's so many different kinds and and, and so many that are so good and some that maybe weren't. Um, but one of my big surprises that just really stands out to me is a guy that, you know, we almost didn't even know he was on the bill. And he may have been more of a special guest than an opening act, but it's, it was for the most unusual show that he was on. And this was Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith, their last Christmas tour. They had a guy named Mark Martell. Oh, wow, this guy blew me away. He blew us all away. And who is this guy? We didn't recognize the name. He was good. He blew everyone away and then found out that he was the voice. He, he was one of the voices in the Bohemian Rhapsody movie where they recreated some of the Freddie Mercury vocals. Some of it was done by Rami Malek. Some of it was actually Freddie Mercury and some of it was Mark Martell. And he was on the show. 
he did somebody to love he did other songs with them too and, and he was on but that may have been my biggest surprise yeah. because i was just blown away and here's a guy that i don't know what he's doing now hopefully he's having great success doing what he's doing but that night it just added to the show so much it was a surprise there's nothing better than a surprise act or when you see a movie or something that you're just blown away from that you didn't expect it just adds to it yeah and I'll never forget him as an opening act and he did kind of what you said adam lambert didn't do right so mark was kind of doing that vocal impression of freddie but yeah. boy he nailed it right and he wasn't trying right. to be freddie but he was like hey here's a story i did some vocals for bohemian rhapsody the movie and because people say i sounded like freddie and so here let me show you and it was just one of those moments where you're like Back to the wall, like, wow, that was awesome. Exactly, because people applauded. But then when he started getting into it and started hitting some of those high notes, the crowd kind of went nuts during the song, which you don't hear that often. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, that was a highlight for me as well. That was great. I got to mention a couple other quick ones. Uh, uh, Lenny Kravitz opening for Aerosmith uh, oh. at Nationwide. That was, that was awesome. Uh, Alice Cooper opening for Motley Crue. Stole oh, the yeah. Stole that that was, he, he just came out, and obviously, legendary perform, performer, but it was one of those nights where you kind of go, wow, that was just, uh, he was at top of his game. And uh, it was funny, sometimes you discover an act that you didn't even know you saw live when you're like looking back through stuff. Just recently I saw uh, that we had Post Malone open up for Justin Bieber, and I remember, oh yeah, that was that guy that was like stumbling around without any shoes on stage. So it was just, it was, I didn't even realize that I'd seen Post Malone live that he'd played in the arenas until I was going back through the archives. And uh, uh, it was just kind of fun to see. And another reason why you should always make a show in time for the opening act. Yes, for sure. I forgot about Post Malone also. Yeah, anybody else on your list? Um, you know what? I think that's kind of what I had on my list. But, you know, as you mentioned, things Alice Cooper should have been on mine. Um, I should have gone down like the roster of acts for the past few years um so I, many that i know i know we're forgetting yeah i know but uh so many great open acts so really like like we've been saying i encourage people to get there on time to see the opening act and enjoy the opening act you never know what will happen and it's always so much fun years later when you're having dinner with friends and say i saw him or her or them when absolutely yes that is such fun conversation. 1,000% yes. Uh, right there with you on that. Arena Guy, hey, if people want to find you on social media, uh, keep track of uh, what you're up to through the week, uh, where's the best place for them to find you? Facebook, just The Arena Guy. Instagram, uh, Twitter, underscore The Arena Guy. And, of course, you and I have done a lot of audio podcasts. Check out the older ones on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And then we do our video podcasts here every week. Absolutely, and we'll, uh, we'll keep it up here for everybody. Uh, and you want to follow along with the latest concert and event news, uh, that's what I do. Uh, keep that up to date on uh, <laughs> uh, the Shot Steed Center and Nationwide Arena websites, but also at the Shot on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and at the, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, at Nationwide Arena on Twitter and Instagram there as well, plus, uh, plus Facebook and all the other stuff. So, uh, Arena Guy, uh, I got to let you go here because I got to get ready for the, for the Jackets game. But always a pleasure, sir. Great, <laughs> great talking to you. Great to see you, and we'll talk to you next week.